Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here at the inaugural Yale and Hollywood Fest, day two. Uh, welcome to the shorts program, uh, specifically the Q&A for the dramatic shorts. We have three films represented um, in this panel, um, Kismet, um, Yearning for Santorini, and On the Whistle. So we get to have a wonderful conversation with these filmmakers. Please type your questions into the chat. Uh, we will have plenty of time to take those um, at the end. And I'm looking forward to introducing you. So first off, um, I would love to hear from our panelists, uh, where they're from, um, what they're working on, basic introduction, uh, what you do in film, what you want to do in film, whatever you would like to share about uh, your identity as a filmmaker, please do so. Uh, Melissa. First up, okay. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Yale uh, 2012, if you can't tell. <laughs> um, I am an actress, writer, director, photographer living out in Los Angeles. Um, so funny, like how do you say what you're working on when it's the middle of the pandemic and <laughs> not much is going on. Um, well, that's not entirely true. We've uh, we've had some shows in production that I've been working on that I can't talk about, but it's been great. Um, yeah, I originally from Virginia, moved to LA seven years ago, like the year after I graduated, and I'm just out here trying to make movies, you know, do the life. <laughs> TJ or Eugenia, either one. Go ahead, Eugenia. Okay. Um, I am uh, Yale 86, the college. Um, I am originally from Romania. Um, the short um, Kismet um, is my starting to be involved in film again. I used to uh, do, um, I, was, I worked in production, uh, videos, commercials, um, some work on documentaries uh, back in the 90s and the noughts. Um, Two of my daughters are in the industry, and so I figured we, I should rejoin the family. <laughs> um, so the interest now is not so much commercials as much, not as much. Um, uh, I think I'm going to start with shorts. Very interested in them. I've been. Um, following what's going on at festivals. Um, now this is extraordinary. Everybody can watch everything online. So lots of platforms, um, uh, incredible times we live through. So lots of subjects to, um, to look at um, and dissect. And so all very exciting. Wonderful. Um, yes, I'm, I'm TJ Noel Sullivan. Um, I'm originally from Hartford, Connecticut and back here now um, through the pandemic. I graduated 2020. Um, so actually On the Whistle was my thesis film at Yale. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's been a weird time to graduate. Um, I, I uh, would like to go into directing um, and so have the feature length version of On the Whistle um, that I've been developing through the pandemic um, and kind of got to a stage now where I'm shopping it a little bit. Um, and so then also moving on to whatever, the, a, a new script so that while I'm waiting for people to get back to me on that script, I can work on some other stuff. Um, so yeah, right right now it's it's been a lot of uh, writing um, and doing, and also doing some like freelance uh, commercial work as well. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I've been up to since I graduated. Awesome. I guess what what a time to be a student. My goodness, or a recent student. Yeah, I I I'm, count myself very lucky to have gotten out um, and be done. I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, well, my first question is for Melissa, and 
my question is how, what was the inspiration behind this film? How did you conceive of it? When, when I watched it for the first time, I remember thinking how um, interesting it was that it was a coming of age story as we might typically um, think of those that was coming of age across generations. Um, and I thought that aspect of it was particularly well, well executed. And you, you managed to do a lot, I thought, in a short amount of time. You explored mother-daughter bond, as I said, the, the classic coming of age, these questions of identity. Um, you, you took a lot of you know, th subjects that we tend to think of as genre, in a way, and you condensed it and made something unique. Um, so please, what was the inspiration behind it? Yeah, um, thank you, by the way. Um, sort of similar to TJ, uh, Yearning for Santorini was actually originally a proven concept for a feature film, which would be um, sort of a road trip actually searching for her mother. Um, it's kind of funny though, I actually got the title first because I'm obsessed with Greece and I really just want to go to Santorini. Um, and then it sort of evolved as I was going through a process of um, sort of just healing and my relationships with authority figures and the maternal figures in my life. Um, and I really wanted to tell an unconventional love story. Uh, even when the, the script was in sort of like the creating process and I had people suggesting that I turn it into an actual love story and a guy and a girl. And I was like, no, that's not really the story that I'm trying to tell here. Cause it, I mean, it is a love story. It's just not a romantic one. Um, and I guess the third thing would be uh, just the plight of foster children in the U.S. is pretty close to my heart. Um, the, statistics, the statistics of the number of kids who age out of the system and then don't have the resources to like go on and like become um, successful and like fully independent adults is way too high in my opinion. So I kind of also just wanted to like subtly raise awareness for that. And, like um, just this idea that like there is a continuation of the story for those kids. Um, yeah, that was sort of my process and thinking for it. Um, well, my next question is for um, TJ on that note um, about it being a proof of concept. I would love to hear about your goals for the film, um, how similarly to Melissa, um, you conceived of it. You of course were a student when you made it. That's really mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, tell us about your film's origin. Yeah, um, so the project came about in a couple ways. I think story-wise, it was a project that I first had the idea for in January of 2019. Um, so, and we shot the film in January of 2020. So I had the idea in January 2019 and I was actually taking a screenwriting class at Yale at the time. Um, and so kind of brought the idea into that class um, and was kind of in this weird middle boat where like initially I wanted to follow this coach and this player over the course of a season. Um, and, but I was trying to write it as a short and that didn't really work. Um, and I think I've always, I think because I really want to direct and that's where my focus lies. Like I've always, uh, thought about writing films that I could actually shoot or that were like feasible for me to either shoot short term or long term. Um, and so I did some, just some talking and, and figuring out like what made sense for the story. Um, and decided, you know, the feature was something I really wanted to pursue. Um, and then, but in my time at Yale and the next year that I had, I realized that making a proof of concept short made a lot of sense um, because I think basketball films, especially, right, have these action sequences and we had to have all these extras and the steady cam to, to capture all this. So it was not going to be easy. Um, definitely, like, you know, I uh, had the opportunity to, uh, see Lucy and Delilah who were on the panel last night, them shooting their feature. Um, and I was very inspired by them, but decided that for the basketball story that I wanted to tell, uh, it was like trying to shoot that whilst an undergrad was not feasible. Um, but I was like, I could do a basketball short really well. I could take the resources I have at my disposal, uh, which included my old high school, um, where my aunt is now the principal. I was like, okay, I can, I have my location, I played basketball in high school. So I had access to a lot of um, former basketball players who I was able to, call, they never acted before or been on a movie set before, but they were excited to come out and play basketball in the film. Um, so I kind of 
saw those pieces and realized I could do a short. Uh, in terms of the story specifically, I think I drew on a lot of themes that personally I, I felt very comfortable exploring those worlds. Um, so that, that world of high school basketball, I think is really interesting. Um, and I knew that uh, it was a great melting pot for the story I wanted to tell, which was kind of a story around white entitlement and this, this kid who spent his life in the suburbs um, and has never had an authority figure of color in his life. Um, and I thought that the bringing that into this high tension place of high school basketball, which like isn't a life or death thing, but having been a high school basketball player, I knew that those two days, like when you're a senior in high school, high school basketball tryouts like are seem like the biggest thing in your life. Um, and so like, I, I thought that was a really fun world to explore uh, and could do some fun stuff with. Oh my gosh, that's so amazing. I actually, that was one of my huge takeaways from watching it. It's just like, you kind of went back and forth between who was the protagonist and who was the antagonist. Um, and that was really like poignant for me. Also, part of the reason I am the backup for uh, this recording is internet issues. So I'm sure Hannah will be back in at any moment. Um, in the meantime, Eugenia, I would love to hear what led you to um, dive into um, both short film, but just like this genre of the thriller as like your sort of comeback for uh, getting back into film. Um, it was a list of things. Um, I am a mother of three girls, uh, two of whom are adults now. And, uh, you know, it was a script that had really, truly great, um, realistic female characters um, and not just the adults, the kid as well, the little girl, um, you know, they find themselves in dark situations and they don't fall apart. Um, I tell you, when I was growing up, nothing really puzzled me more um, in movies than to see, <laughs> it used to drive me crazy. You know, you have um, a woman or a girl, they try to escape a situation and they're almost free and then they trip on a tree root or they get their dress caught in a fence and their high heels break and suddenly, you know, they're helpless and they're out of ideas, they're out of options and they're stuck in place and it all happens, you know, it's just long enough for um, the bad character to catch up to them and um, it annoyed me. I mean, it, it, so we had also in my family, we actually, uh, there was a kidnapping in my family. So I was able to relate to that too. Um, and, you know, the women, the girls, they didn't fall apart. Um, you know, you've got this little gem of a script that um, became what I feel is a little gem of a short movie. Um, and it's got um, very sharp, it's got inventive, it's got um, courageous, girls, female characters, um, down to the girl who, you know, I don't know if I'm allowed to say what she does at the end, but, but she very courageously um, uh, confronts the, the uh, a possibly bad outcome head on. Um, um, I also, I thought the atmosphere that they were trying to create and actually they I think they created it very well you know you, you, your heart is in your throat the entire time you watch it and I think every scene can possibly go either way in every shot you don't know what's going to happen the tension is very high throughout um, and I, that's just that's not just the writing that's also the um, um, the directing and, and everything that that the team put together the music um, so I knew it was going to be good. Uh, I was hoping it was going to be good because it started with a very good script. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I could see my girls needing to, in every scene, through every line, they needed to solve a pretty dire, difficult, puzzle situation and I like that it was realistically done they you was very believable and the, the characters that were written they were very believable to believe to, to begin with so I like that um 
you know, you have a young child, you have a pretty much right out of the academy policewoman, and then you have the older uh, seasoned detective. And you know what, they're all standing tall, they own who they are, their knowledge, um, they own their set of skills. Um, and they own their, you know, uh, strength to function very well under extreme pressure. That to me was biggest attraction. So yeah, that's kind of. Yes, I love that so much. Um, kind of a follow-up question actually. So I know that you said you wanted to get started for the short film. Are there any plans to expand on the story? Um, well, it's very interesting you say that because um, one of the things, even before I saw the final short, I just, I remember saying you could do a whole season of True Detective based just on this short and it would be binge watching. Nine episodes, 12 episodes, 19 episodes, however long you want to do the season, you probably couldn't put it down. Um, and so how could I say no to it? I said yes, and uh, we'll see where it goes from here. Um, but yeah, um, I wanted to see what happens with this and I, I saw it and I loved it. So, you know, uh, watch this space as they say. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And Hannah's back. All right. Apologies for the technical difficulties, everyone. I'm so sorry. We all have been, the internet is very unstable. Melissa took it in stride. As she does, as she does. She's such a pro. Well, I do have a question if it hasn't been asked in my absence for Eugenia, specifically. Are we at a point in the conversation for another question? Absolutely, I can. <laughs> um, what made you want to be involved with this project other than wanting to get back into film and what drew you to the script? Yeah, that it was, uh, I guess that's what I answered while you were gone and it was- Oh goodness, I missed the, I missed the- uh, it, it really had to do with the female characters. I thought they were very well portrayed, very well written to begin with and then very well acted obviously. Um, but um, it, it just, it was very close to home. You know, I, I, I did say I'm a mother of three daughters and I, I, I want to see them um, be very strong in whatever situation they're in. And uh, um, this was, this was uh, it was so beautifully put together, the, uh, the script and they were all presented so nicely. I'm like, you know what, I need to get involved with this. And uh, um, yeah, we'll do a whole season now. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what happens next. But that is the main reason. Um, atmosphere, music, that, that all came later and it all fell together into the most beautiful package. It's like, you know, things were up in the air and then it started, everything started falling apart. In the, falling, sorry, falling apart. Falling in place, every single part. Um, so... Um, I'm very pleased with the final project. So Mike did a great job. He keeps you breathless from beginning to end. Um, and you just, you, you're you dying to know what happens to these characters when the short is finished. Yes, yes. Um, absolutely. Um, what other, you said you were getting back into film and I hope I didn't miss this too, but has this particular project ignited a desire to work on another kind of film? Maybe something else with female character, um, more, well, more thrillers? Um, I am, um, I've been working with a few other um, scripts that are also short, um, for, for, sorry, for, for short movies, um, just to, one of the things I said while you're gone is that there, there are so many platforms out there and the possibility to present things are pretty much endless um, and subject matters. And there's so many avenues that have opened up. You know, there are no more formulas. You can pretty much um, 
invent and create and and see where it takes you and um i think it's such an exciting time to be in um in an industry that really is is in the middle of a volcano like the rest of the world but but you know maybe like a phoenix a whole bunch of amazing projects will rise out of it and uh, we'll see absolutely and um I think it has been, a, of course, a difficult year for everyone, but film seems to have, you know, suffered greatly too. So I like that optimism that there that there are opportunities now, and we have to figure out how to yeah. how to maximize on those. Um, a question I have for all of you um, is: What were the lessons from this particular project that you learned as a filmmaker? that will carry you forward in your career? I can, I can say, um, I think there were there were two less, I think uh, one thing that I've always tried to do in all my projects is like make new mistakes as a director. It's been my, has been my mantra of like, okay, each project I'm gonna make some mistakes, but as long as I'm making new mistakes, that's okay, cause I'm, I'm moving. Um, and I think overall I was like happy with this project in that from some of the previous shorts I'd done, I learned a lot. Um, and you know, here, one of the things here was that uh, the so much of the film, specifically Luke's character, like does not have much dialogue, um, which was interesting. I mean, like even from the casting process, it was very interesting. Like our self tape auditions, uh, we asked the character, like the lead character, I said a total of four lines or four words in the self tape auditions. And it was so much reactionary and listening. Um, and so like, I think I learned a lot about directing in that sense where I wasn't just directing dialogue, but it was directing the, the nonverbal cues. Um, so that was, that was really interesting. Um, and then I think my bigger takeaway though, as a filmmaker was trust community. Um, so I, I, this was the first film that I was able to come back to Hartford to shoot. Um, and I already mentioned, mm -hmm. like, I was able to film in my old high school. Um, but all of our line, we had a cast and crew of about 40 people our lunch for all three days was donated by a local restaurant. Um, there were a lot, you know, my old basketball team, all the jerseys and basketballs and stuff in the film. Um, not only did the basketball team basically agree not to practice for three days so that we could use the gym and film for three days straight, but then they also lent us all their gear. Um, so a lot of, uh, you know, really important lessons about community and how, especially when you're making these like, low budget trying just pull it together kind of films so much of what we were able to do was because we were able to take our budget and then like maximize it by using mm -hmm. what community members were willing to donate and support so absolutely that is true independent filmmaking i love that so much <laughs> <laughs> teamwork makes a dream work film is family um for me, I think my biggest lesson was actually resilience, but to just keep mm -hmm. going and keep pushing through. I actually wrote and sorry, I think I froze. <laughs> just briefly. Um, yeah, I filmed three years ago and didn't finish editing until a month ago um and i think just the fact that i never completely gave up and kept going and i'm going to stop my video so you can actually hear me um yeah just resilience i'm gonna end there because i can't this is a good lesson in resilience <laughs> It really is. <laughs> exactly. I, I I did that on purpose to underscore my point. Eugenia, what were your lessons? Um, best thing that could have happened was that I worked with a group of 20-somethings, and that's how old I was when I started in film. And... Um, it was extraordinary to watch and literally to just learn. And uh, you guys have such an, an, an extraordinary array of tricks 
at the you know the tip of your of your fingers is that expression um and stuff can happen um in such different ways it, it was it was beautiful to both remember but also to look at the talent that's that's out there and everybody working with everybody else would actually it, it's exactly what Pija was saying um and for me it was you know, great to just see the progress made you said that uh, you know my point of view is optimistic look you know the world is where it is and we got to make um a lot of lemonade out of all these lemons so you you take what everybody else knows and uh, you put the best people in the best job on your team and you hope to uh, you know move forward together as as with with everybody's tag you know Maybe you can request for uh, every ego to be left at the door so that the only thing that walks in the door is the talent that everyone has. And then it's extraordinary. It's, it's, um, I, I still think it's the best industry to be in. You just move from one amazing project to another, hopefully amazing. <laughs> um, and like you just said, you know, you learn from your mistakes and you, you cannot possibly not make them. And also I think you cannot possibly not learn from them. So it's all good. It's all good. It's... It is all good. Yes. Um, and we're so blessed to, to work on these amazing projects. As you said, hopefully amazing. Um, we, I, we, do have, we do have a question from the festival director, Quentin, um, for Kismet. So could you talk about the ending um, of that movie and, and what is it about? He asks. So, all right. So the opinions were, were literally right down the middle. Honestly, I think that ending was the 51 versus 49%, kind of like the Senate, right? <laughs> um, so I can't remember who the vice president was that came in and, and, and said, this is the this is the deciding vote. Um, we had a version where the phone call isn't made, and so you don't know that the girl survived. You don't know that. Am I giving too much away? Has everybody seen the 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 films? Well, they should have. Yeah. <laughs> So one, one ending, and I will I do have to tell you that was actually my favorite ending because you really don't know. Um, and it was extraordinarily dramatic. I, I can't even begin to tell you what it was like to just leave it at, you know, the little girl point, pointing the gun and the phone call doesn't happen. So you don't know that they're okay. Um, you do see the um, younger, the police, the local policewoman, uh, the younger policewoman, uh, you see her moving. So, you know, she's not dead, but still, um, and the other one was with, the, with um, you know, clearly between the little girl with the gun and the policewoman still alive, even though it kind of looked like, you know, vampire style, the guy it looked like he broke her neck. Um, you know, another trophy to put on his walls of uh, hunted trophies. Um, a lot of people like the ending with uh, with the phone call being made to reassure, you know, kind of reassure the audience that everything is fine. As I already told you, I'm in the 49% that would have preferred not that not to be there. Um, and you can you can you can build on that short. That one of the amazing things about it really, which I forgot to talk about is that I really truly believe that every single one of those characters has such a great backstory that you can actually have two, three episodes for each one of them with an arc that, that, that presents them really well for every word that they say, there is such economy of, in the dialogue, just enough to really pick your curiosity and then 
so hopefully we can take it in different directions but yeah so that's the ending i'm in the minority a tiny bit you know 49 percent so that's the ending the ending the way it is right now is that it's a happy it's a happy ending hollywood happy ending um, well it, we do have another question for your film from um one of our attendees um and it's a simple question who is the guy being interrogated charlotte um now that is enough well um there is enough that in his um background to warrant um a closer look to you know, when there's a crime committed, they immediately go after the registered sex offenders. If you happen to have the same color van as the van that was seen leaving the scene of the crime. Um, if you have pictures of little kids or if you have underwear of little kids in your trailer and you are not a father. Uh, but there, there could be other stories to, to Charlotte. You can think of him as somebody who is actually a good guy and wrongly accused and um, you know, suffering tremendously from, from uh, um, various backstories in, in his life. Even the fact that you know, he goes by Charlotte and not Charlie, you know, that alone can be, uh, can be quite, you can make quite the story out of that. So uh, he, is, he is a suspect. He, it turns out he's the wrong suspect. Um, but every investigation can go in the wrong direction um, easily if you watch crime shows like I do. <laughs> so, so that's, um, um, and something can definitely be done by the fact that he picks his, that, that picking of the nail, um, that can be his saving or his major downfall. So. Like I said, I think I think we can we can we can work with the material. Um, I was so impressed with the script. So much was implied and told in it that you can you can make amazing stuff, amazing amazing material um, for more episodes for something much um, much much bigger in length. And I really think it's like I said, it's I really think it is a whole you can do a whole season of, of an incredible crime show, crime story with it. Yeah. Um, our attendee Delilah has a question um, for Melissa, uh, wanting to hear more about the kind of fantasy sequence with Santorini and her birth mother in reading Jane Austen. Um, what were those decisions landing on that book in sequence? Um, I will try if the Lord grants me uh, internet. <laughs> um, well, Pride and Prejudice is one of my favorite books. <laughs> and I, I drew a lot about, I think, my own life for Santorini, um, some consciously and some subconsciously. And I am an introvert and have been an avid reader since I was very small. Um, so fantasy sequences are just part of my daily life. Um, but I really wanted to capture Sandrini's inner life in this story. Like, I feel like the, the main thing about coming of age stories, it's sort of the inner transformation that happens as you're like growing up. Um, and for Sandrini to be faced with the idea of like the parent that gave her up for adoption I just feel like there are a lot of thoughts going through her head of like what would have been what could have been if she'd stayed with her mom like what would life have been would she have been doing homework at the table while her mom was doing work or like would they take picnics and read together just sort of like this idealized life um just sort of juxtaposed between like what could have been versus like what her life was like normally in her foster home with an amazing foster mother, but who was still not her birth mother. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, I actually have a question for TJ, if that's okay. Um, I know that you mentioned that you were working on some new scripts while you were shopping around the feature for On the Whistle. I'd love to hear what you're working on right now. Yeah. Um... They're, they are still 
or I mean, I'm I am on page seventy five. Uh, today I got to seventy five on this the new script I'm working on. I think my overall approach, which I will share, is that um, I'm looking and saying, you know, given where the like standard industry is at right now, uh, trying to go out and make a project just by like making it happen and and from you know from the lessons from the short of taking advantage of community and the resources I have available to me. Um, could be really huge. Um, so I'm kind of thinking in the realm of who are some really talented actors I know, um, what are some great, amazing locations that I have access to. Um, so I'm currently working on like a, I'll describe it as a micro budget heist film um, that takes advantage of some of the really cool locations I have access to and some of the really amazing actors that I know well. Um, and, but it, it is still in the very early stages of development uh, but is the kind of thing that I think um, I'm, I'm looking towards like, yes, obviously I would love to have to get the financing to shoot on the whistle of feature, but because it's a basketball film, it, you know, requires these gym sequences with lots of extras and that's not the easiest thing. Um, so like, can I do one that is a tight narrative that has, you know, most scenes just have three people, um, but is still entertaining and is, you know, uh, has like real movie value, uh, which is a, a tough thing. <laughs> I think that's quite ambitious, a low budget heist. Goodness. <laughs> yes. But you learned teamwork with this one. So I'm excited to see what you do in that regard. Yeah, no, um, I think it's it's definitely looking at some films that have been able to do really smart heists well. And like, if, if you can, in, instead of, I, you know, I'm overall, I'm not a big fan of movies that like have big gun action violent sequences. Um, and so I'm thinking about like, can you do a heist that's really smart? And of course it's still visual, like not just someone typing at a computer the whole day, but like a smart heist that is visual, um, but also has high production value. It's, it's a challenge, but that's, that's why we have all this time in quarantine to, to work on these things. It's true, taking advantage. Um, well, I have a final question um, for all three of you very quickly because we are approaching our time, um, but What's the one piece of wisdom that you would pass on to the student filmmaker who wants to break into the industry, who wants to take that first step? What do you say to them um, tonight? I, I mean, I just graduated, but I think my, my piece uh, for the, the students that are there now um, is make, make, make. Uh, so I think the, the thing, looking back on my four years, the thing I'm the decision I'm happiest with is the fact that each year I forced, I like made a short film um, mm -hmm. and was just like on this path of like, I'm not like, I'm working on other people's films and still learning, right? Every year I worked on one of the thesis films and learned a lot from that. And that really helped me pull off my own thesis film. But at the same time, I was like, let me find actors and find locations and, and try making some of those mistakes as a director myself. Um, Cause I think that is so big of just like, you, the first time you do it, no matter how much you prep, how much, how many YouTube videos you watch, how many other sets you've been on, the first time you like actually have to direct, you're gonna make a mistake. And the second time and the third time. So the more, the more times you can, if you wanna be a filmmaker, just keep making films and like get those kinks out. Great advice. Yeah, I think mine would be similar to TJ's. Um but just to put it succinctly, stop taking your own excuses. Um, I think that TJ proved and Delilah and Lucy with making a feature film the first ever as a thesis. And the fact that I shot three years ago and I was just like, I'm just gonna finish it and get it done. Like, um, I feel like the only thing to do to get something done is to actually just go out and do it. Um, you don't need the people, you don't need resources, like use what you have with the time that you have and don't take no from an answer, even if it's from yourself. Wise words, wise words. Eugenia, would um, you like to give us the fi your th final thoughts? Yeah, um, uh, well, two things. Number one is I really, um, I've, I've learned over the, over the years that, you gotta meet people. You gotta learn from other people. You gotta. Uh, it's a cliche, but it really doesn't matter who you know as much as 
what matters is who knows you. And they need to know about where you are, what are you doing, keep track of that, be polite to people in a, in a good way. Um, and um, stay informed, stay on top of what's going on in the industry, stay on top of trends um, and constantly, constantly approach everything as if you're learning brand new things. Um, and, you know, it's a joy. And, and, you know, once you don't enjoy it anymore, then you're in the wrong place. And that's true of any industry. That's, and the second thing I wanna say is casting. If you, mm -hmm. if you learn to do that right, you half the battle is won. I mean, obviously you need a good script and you need lots of other things. Casting is so important. You've got to have the right person basically eat the screen and, you know, go out there and, you know, with the hand, just grab the viewer and, and, and hold on to his or her heart and brain for the rest of the movie. Casting is crucial. Thank you. That's a, that's a wonderful note to end this, this panel on. Um, again, thank you all so much. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the attendees for taking the time to not only watch these films, but listen to these incredibly talented filmmakers talk about them. Um, and thank you too from the Yale and Hollywood Fest team. Uh, we really appreciate you being part of this first year um, thank because you. it's been a joy to, to do it. Uh, so on that note, thank you all. Um, day two, we have day three tomorrow. Um, please come back for that. Uh, watch these films if you have not already and have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>